But we do want to highlight uh, a couple of our new IPM specialists, not new, they've been here a bit. Um, and the reason we don't have a heavy IPM is because the Ag Retailers Association does so much IPM at their meeting. But um, uh, uh, these two don't know, but they'll have a session next year. So we're going to have a little bit more IPM next year and kind of bring it back to how we used to. Uh, so we'll, we'll be a little bit heavier in IPM next year and uh, make sure our state specialists are, are involved across the board. But the, the lack of IPM is because Ag Retailers Association did so much. Like, I mean, how many credits of IPM did you have last month? Like all of them? Dang near. Dang near. So uh, I'm not going to let them take over our, our Shining Stars anymore. So with that, uh, brief introduction, Miriam, come on up. Um, Miriam, come on. You can come on up. It's all right. Uh, can we load Miriam's Dr. Annons? Miriam, how do you say your last name? I always Owns. Huh? Owns. Owns. All right. So uh, the first of our presentations, we're going to look at uh, wheat disease uh, with Dr. Owns. So should be good. You should be on and your speaker's on. Okay. Sound good? Yes. Very hard to see from here. Okay, I should be here. You can see this. Okay. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, thank you, Brian, for putting this IPM session. So switching gears now to talk about diseases. Um, I am uh, with the WIT um, uh, improvement team, so working at the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology, and my role is primarily to manage WIT diseases. Uh, my colleague later, she will be talking about the other field crops. So I am with the department for about two years now. And uh, in this seminar, we'll be talking about the different diseases that we see in Oklahoma and on the different management strategies uh, to manage these diseases. So this graph is showing Oklahoma wheat production uh, and yield over the last 10 years. So usually we are having around or over 100 million bushels in production. Uh, but in some years, especially when we have drought in 2014, uh, last two seasons, 2022 and 2023, we have severe reduction in yield. Um, so, uh, in addition to these abiotic stresses like a drought and heat, diseases also cause uh, issues like stripe rust, uh, leaf rust, uh, leaf spotting diseases, and root rot. This table is uh, summarizing uh, disease losses in Oklahoma. Uh, so, this is an estimate based on the uh, crop protection network. So these are um, uh, uh, data from 2018 up to 2022. On average, we have 10% reduction in yield due to diseases. So this is uh, considered a high number, and that corresponds to around $55 million in losses, which is around $12.8 uh, uh, per acre. Breaking this down by diseases, uh, so I looked at all the different diseases and what I am showing in this graph are the top diseases in terms of their yield losses. So uh, the first two diseases that come on the, on the top of list, the list are the rust diseases, leaf rust and stripe rust. But in years like in 2022 and 2023, because we have severe drought, we, um, these diseases are not causing uh, much damage. Leaf spotting diseases, we have 10 spot, uh, septoria. We also see powdery mildew. In, in dry years, like uh, the last two seasons, we are seeing more of the uh, root rots, both, both the common root rots, as well as the physarium, crown, and root rots. And viruses, uh, primarily the most common one in Oklahoma is barley yellow dwarf. Uh, and uh, wheat tick mosaic virus, that's a, a problem primarily in the panhandle area. Uh, but in some years, like in 2022, we saw it also in other places in central Oklahoma. Foliar diseases can be caused by different organisms. Uh, by fungi, so these are uh, the most common diseases that we see in Oklahoma. Uh, symptoms and signs of leaf rust and stripe rust. 
uh, leaf spotting diseases, uh, ten spots, septoria tritici blotch or septoria leaf blotch, septoria nodorum blotch, it used to be called stagonospora nodorum blotch, they just kept changing the name, uh, but they are the same. Uh, spot blotch, uh, it's also tr having uh, an increased incidence and, and severity in Oklahoma. Even with the drought in the last two seasons, I see this um, black, uh, black spots on the leaf, so that's an uh, indication of um, this disease. It used to be a saprophyte, but now it changed to be a, 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 a pathogen. And powdery mildew. Foliar diseases can also be caused by bacteria. Uh, this is bacterial leaf streak. Uh, it is, um, uh, this is how the symptoms look like on the leaf, but we also can see uh, the same pathogen can cause the black chaff on the gloom. And here is like this black discoloration on the gloom, on the lower stem, on the, on the stem of the plant, and also on the own. Um, we don't see it much. It's only in an area where we have a lot of moisture and um, plus some warm temperatures. Uh, it is a problem primarily in the northern Great Plains. So we occasionally see it here in Oklahoma. Viruses, uh, the most common virus is barn yellow dwarf. Uh, and in the panhandle area, we, uh, we are dealing with Wittrich mosaic complex. So this includes Wittrich mosaic virus, Tritico mosaic virus, and High Plains virus that are transmitted by uh, wheat cormite. Soil-borne wheat mosaic virus and wheat spindle streak mosaic virus, this used to be uh, important diseases back in the 1980s uh, because most of the varieties are susceptible at that time. But now the current varieties, most of them are resistant, so we don't see much uh, of a problem caused by these two viruses. And also, probably because of the increase in temperature, we are seeing reduced uh, severity uh, uh, caused by uh, soil barn and uh, wheat spindle streak mosaic. So symptoms of barley yellow dwarf, uh, you can see this um, discoloration. Usually it's yellow to purple in color that starts from the leaf tip going toward the base of the leaf. And the virus is transmitted by cereal aphids, primarily the bird cherry oat aphid and uh, green bugs. Wheat streak mosaic, um, it's a problem in the panhandle, but in some years we see it in uh, central Oklahoma. This is a field, I believe, in Garfield County, uh, where we see a complete loss of, I believe, half of the field was lost due to wheat streak mosaic virus. This is how the symptoms look like, and it is transmitted by uh, wheat corn mites. On the heads, we see diseases like uh, the gloom blotch, uh, the black chaff, the, the symptoms are very similar. Uh, in, mo in many cases, we need to have a lab test to confirm whether it is uh, a fungus, which is the Parasagonospora nodorum, uh, that causes the gloom blush, or it is a bacteria uh, causing the black chaff. Uh, loose mud and common band. Last year, I, I received uh, uh, a few emails asking about using grain from infected fields. Uh, with loose mud or common bands. So, so the answer to that is we don't recommend doing that because that will have a severe effect on, on, uh, on stand and on, on yield later on in the season. And Fusarium herb blight, uh, we, don't, we don't see it much in our area due to the drought, but it is a problem um, in some years in northeastern Oklahoma. Coming to root diseases, um, last two seasons due to the drought, we are seeing these dry land diseases, uh, primary fusarium uh, root and crown rots caused by multiple fusarium species, and common root rots, which is caused by bipolaris sorokiniana. So this same pathogen, it can cause the uh, spot blush that I was showing earlier in the foliar diseases, uh, 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 but also can cause common root rots uh, especially when, when the plant is stressed due to drought. In some cases, so we, in, like the, the disease is more obvious toward the end of the season because it's easy to spot this white head. And by looking at, at the plants, at the lower stem and the roots, you see very poor root system and discolored root and lower stem. 
And uh, in some cases, we see pinkish discoloration. That's an indication of infection by Fusarium. So for the disease to occur, we uh, basically look at the, we need to have a susceptible host, uh, a pathogen that is present that can cause disease and conducive environment. So basically to manage the disease, uh, we don't have much control over the environment, but we can reduce the inoculum in the field or we can, uh, and uh, we can use a uh, resistant variety. So uh, in an integrated disease management, we are looking at using different uh, methods. So if the disease is not present in our area or in our country, we need to uh, use quarantine and inspection of the borders. This applies to diseases like coronal band, that we don't have it, uh, wheat blast that is present in some country in Asia like Bangladesh, and uh, some nasty ra races of stem rust like the UG99 that is present in Africa and other parts of Asia. Uh, physical, by using temperature and radiation to kill the pathogen. Uh, biological, which is to use another organism to control uh, uh, the, the wheat uh, pathogen. But for my talk, I will be focusing on, on three main components, cultural practices, uh, genetic or host resistance, and uh, chemical controls using fungicides. So for cultural practices, this is, um, it is really important to control uh, to, uh, or to manage residue in the field. This will help with diseases like ten spot and septoria. Uh, and that's because the resting bodies that you see, this black dot on the, on the straw, those are resting bodies of the pathogen that can survive and then become the first or the primary inoculum in the coming season. So by keeping the residue in the field, we are increasing the inoculum and um, having more uh, infection early in the season. We need to control volunteer weeds. This is very important, especially uh, for vi uh, controlling viral diseases like barley yellow dwarf and wheat sick mosaic virus, uh, because this serves as a host for both the vector uh, aphids and, and coal mites and also the uh, virus. So this is a, a graph um, showing uh, alternate, uh, alternative hosts for wheat, uh, coal, uh, for wheat coal mite and wheat thick mosaic. So it's not only uh, wheat that can be infected by the virus and the, the vectors, uh, but also or the vector, which is the wheat coal mite, uh, but we also have other crops like uh, barley, corn, uh, sorghum, millet, and uh, other uh, grassy weeds. So here the the hosts that are on the lower part of this graph, they are um, a high risk, which means they are very good uh, hosts for both uh, the wheat streak mosaic virus and the corn mice. And that includes uh, joint goat grass, sand burr, uh, foxtail, and, and, and other uh, grasses. Planting date, it is recommended to plant after October 1st in Oklahoma, in, in northern Oklahoma, and after October 15th in southern Oklahoma, and that's basically to break what we call the green bridge uh, between the previous crop and the new crop that should uh, reduce the population of aphids or curl mite and that reduces the infection uh, during uh, fall because that's the most damaging uh, infection uh, in the season. We can have spring infection but the fall infection is uh, the most damaging uh, for, for yield. And this can help uh, reduce the uh, infection by aphids and wheat coral mites and consequently reduce the infection uh, of body yellow dwarf virus, uh, wheat streak mosaic, critical mosaic, and high plains. Selecting resisting uh, variety uh, is very crucial. So this QR code will take you to the OGI varieties uh, that are um, released. Uh, both the old varieties as well as the most current varieties. So you will have characteristics, both agronomic quality and uh, disease uh, uh, response to the different diseases that we see in Oklahoma. So the OSU breeding program to release the variety, we need around 300,000 data points. And disease uh, uh, ratings, those uh, have around 40% of the 300,000 data points. So this is a 
a lot of data that we collect on uh, breeding lines before a variety is released. So our lab is um, uh, doing both uh, evaluation in the greenhouse and the field to support the breeding program. Uh, my lab technician, Brian Olson, is uh, now doing uh, greenhouse evaluation during the month, uh, the, month uh, the winter season, uh, and evaluate uh, the uh, OSU breeding lines for uh, leaf rust, powdery mildew, and ten spot. Uh, we start including spot blush because that's becoming uh, uh, an increased, uh, uh, has an increased uh, incidence and, and severity in Oklahoma. We have, uh, uh, in, in the spring, we have multiple disease nurseries. This include the soil borne wheat mosaic and wheat spangled street mosaic uh, nursery. We have a barley yellow dwarf nursery, and we also do uh, evaluation of uh, powdery mildew and leaf spotting diseases if uh, they occur uh, uh, during the season, and especially on the most advanced uh, lines. Uh, we do have a leaf rust nursery in Stillwater and a striped rust nursery in Chickasha. Uh, in addition to this, uh, Oklahoma nurseries, we also send materials to collaborators in other states, like in Washington, Kansas, and Nebraska, especially if they have higher disease pressure than what we do here, so that we can get uh, better data for selection. As I mentioned earlier in, in, in my uh, presentation, leaf rust and stripe rust are the main uh, damaging diseases of wheat in Oklahoma. And that's why it's really rare for the breeding program to consider releasing a variety with susceptibility to both diseases, leaf rust and stripe rust. Uh, so this is a, a list of the leaf rust, uh, of the, uh, leaf rust resistant varieties that were released after 2017, uh, including Big Country, Green Hammer, uh, Butler's Gold, Stat PL Plus, uh, Sky Dance, Miss Gold, and most recently High Cotton. So leaf rust is, is, a, is a challenging disease. This is because the population uh, of the pathogen uh, uh, evolves very rapidly. So we are not looking at only having a, a resistant variety, but also uh, being selective on the resistant genes uh, that we include so that we have a more durable type of resistance, like the one present in uh, Duster and its uh, grandson, Uncharted. Uncharted is another uh, good example for barley yellow dwarf resistance because it carries two resistant genes, uh, BDV1 and BDV2. So this, uh, uh, this variety is almost immune for uh, barley yellow dwarf. The OSU breeding program is also working on uh, resistance to wheat streak mosaic virus. Um, this is a problem in the Panhandle area. In some cases, we see it in, in, uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, so we are relying on uh, three genes. That's what we have, and most of them are not coming from wheat, so we have to integrate them from Tainopyron. So that takes time uh, for the wheat community to integrate something from wide relatives into wheat. Uh, so the, most, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, first one that was identified was WSM1, and it is present in uh, the OSU wheat variety breakthrough. Uh, so this is the most resistant variety that we have in uh, the breeding program. Uh, we are now working on WSM3, uh, so it is identified in Kansas. It's not yet in any of the commercial varieties, uh, but that's uh, considered a very effective gene. Uh, so the, the uh, OSU lines that you are seeing here in bold, they carry these resistant genes, and uh, hopefully they can, uh, one of them at least, being released in the Panhandle area where this disease is a problem. In addition to resistance to uh, wheat streak mosaic virus, we also look at having genes that are um, providing resistance to the vector, to the wheat curl mite. Uh, and the most effective gene that we have now is CMC4. Uh, and these are a list of Oklahoma lines that we have in the breeding program that carry CMC4. And some of them, they carry also other um, uh, resistant genes for the wheat streak mosaic virus. Coming to the uh, third component of uh, management, which is using uh, fungicides. Uh, so we can use this uh, either for, uh, like for seed treatments uh, early in the season, so that, that will help us uh, control diseases like bans and smut, uh, foliar diseases that happen in, in the fall, like uh, some uh, leaf spotting diseases or stripe rust, and uh, root rot, especially that they were um, uh, very common last two seasons due to the drought. 
So this can help the uh, stand uh, establishment. So this is a comparison between uh, two plots uh, side by side, one that is treated with, uh, with uh, fungicide and the other uh, not treated. Uh, we have different products that you can find in, in the Extension Asian Handbook. Uh, so every county educator should have uh, this handbook and it has a, a list of the products that you can use. Uh, so this is, a, this is a, a just some uh, of what you can find on the table, uh, the rate and the different diseases that they uh, control. Uh, fungicide application during the season, uh, this will help to protect the yield potential. Uh, so uh, to determine whether a fungicide application is needed, we need to do uh, scouting that can be a jointing stage for diseases like uh, septoria, tan spot, and powdery mildew uh, that usually occur on the lower canopy. And then a uh, flag leaf stage, we usually scout for rust diseases, leaf rust and stripe rust. Uh, remember again, the, leaf rust, uh, the uh, flag leaf is the main part of the plant that we need to protect uh, with fungicide. And in area like uh, in uh, northeastern Oklahoma where a scab uh, can be present, we do scouting at flowering stage because that's the most susceptible uh, uh, stage of the plant uh, where the infection can occur. So once we uh, do the scouting, we can determine the disease level that we have in the field uh, and, that, and, and based on the weather forecast. For example, let's say I, I reported that we have striped rust in, in still water and also a few, few, year, a few weeks back, we have it in Texas. So that, that makes the uh, disease risk high, especially if we have uh, cool and, um, and, uh, and moist weather in, in the coming few days. So uh, we have high risk and fungicide application is recommended. Uh, we have a, a, a forecast model for the uh, SCAP, uh, which is a, a national collaboration. So all you can do is uh, around flowering stage, go to the, uh, to the uh, forecast model for SCAP and that will give you the risk in, in our area. So that uh, will determine whether fungicide application is uh, needed or not. Uh, we are trying to do it for other diseases, uh, starting with stripe rust. We are working on a collaboration with Kansas State uh, to develop a, a forecast model for uh, stripe rust. And of course, uh, we, we need to look at what variety we are growing. Uh, are we growing a resistant variety or a susceptible variety? And, and uh, based on that, decide whether a fungicide application is needed. What uh, products are available? Um, you can go to this current report uh, that was prepared by my predecessor, Dr. Bob Hanker. Uh, you can find answers to many questions related to fungicide application. Also, this QR code will take you to an um, updated list of uh, products that we have and their efficacy in uh, controlling different foliar diseases. Uh, so these are the different products that we have. And basically, the uh, wheat pathologists from all over the state they come together each year to update this table and um, make sure uh, we, we have a good understanding of, of the label and um, on the rate, on the restriction, harvest restriction for each product. So with that, I, I come to the end of the talk and I'll be happy to take any questions uh, if you have any. Any questions for Miriam? Maida. Whoever. <laughs> I just want to ask you to go back to the slide and get that uh, number up. Uh, is this the fungicide? 7668 seven, six, six, is one. Before. Yeah, that one. Current report 7668. Right. I cannot hear you. From is is the the ah uh, it it was not the same uh, patuvar I believe it's exontomanas it's just like the patuvar is different so yeah so this is more specified to wheat. 
So, and, and I have one last question before I let you go. Do we have any resources for agronomists and folks like me that's a one-stop shop for all of the, uh, the varieties offered in the state for disease resistance? I mean, if I want to see AgriPro, if I want to see Westbred, if I want to see OGI in a single place, is there anything like that for even the plain states yet? I think uh, I'm working with Dr. Silva on updating our disease rating for the varieties that we have. But I have the, um, yeah, I think if you go 2018 to the is last, that's cross, that's cross market, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, K-State, okay. Yeah, All right, I'll just check it. Updated their list. Uh, so, but this is the, what you can, where yeah. you can find the most up-to-date uh, list for the uh, varieties and their reactions to different diseases. But we are working on a fact sheet to update our ratings for the varieties. All right. Thank you, Miriam. Yeah, thank you. Let's give her a hand. All right. Our next, our next speaker, I'll just let you guys transition the mic. Mic's across. Do you want the handheld? You may not have a place to clip. Uh, is it? Uh, okay, go for that one then. All right. So our, our next speaker is, and, and I don't know if it's good or bad the way I pronounce her name, but Maida Dufek, Dr. Maida Dufek. Very good. I, I, I know more. Uh, Brazilians than I know uh, about any other. So uh, Maria or Maeda Dufek. Uh, another one of our, our newer ads, I think uh, both of these two came on. You're about a year in for the two of you, right? About a year, year and a half. And so, so relatively new hires, um, and we'll get to our new new hires in a second. But Maeda is working on our diseases and our row crop specifically, and she's done some really neat work, and so we're starting to get into some stuff. So, Maida. All right, can you guys hear me? Oh, yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Maida Dufek, and I am the new row crops extension pathologist at Oklahoma State University. And if you guys are not familiar with this title, row crops extension pathologist is a big title, right? You may remember my predecessor in this position, Dr. John Demicon. So I'm his replacement. My position here in the university, 7% extension, 30% research. So all the research that I conducted here in the state of Oklahoma is to help growers to better manage plant disease in row crops. So I'll be covering the disease of row, for all the field crops and row crops, but wheat. So Maria is the plant pathologist here that covers the wheat crop, and I'll be covering all the other ones, including soybean, uh, cotton, peanuts, corn, canola, sorghum, everything that you guys need me for it, I'll be here for. And today I'm here to talk about the management of soybean disease in Oklahoma, especially focus on the lessons learned in 2023. That was my first growing season here in the state. So as a good plant pathologist, I start to bring up the disease triangle. So when you think about the management of plant diseases, what are the factors that need to be considered, right? So we know that for half the development of the disease in the field, we need the interaction of these three factors. We need a pathogen that's virulent and can cause disease in the plant. We need a host that is susceptible for that specific pathogen. And we need the right environmental conditions. And we used to say that to have the development of the disease, we need to have all these three factors interacting at the same time. So you need to say that you need a pest in the field because time is also crucial to have the development of the disease and to have the interaction of these three factors. So thinking about the 2023 growing season, and if you look at this disease triangle, what was the factor that was limiting the occurrence of the disease in the field or was slowing down the occurrence of fo especially foliar disease in soybean, if you think about in this triangle? The environmental conditions, right? Because we, do, we did experience a growing season that was very dry and very hot and was not favorable for the development of several diseases here in the state. And that's good to keep this in mind because this is going to help us to understand some of the results that I'm going to present later. And when you think about the management of plant diseases or foliar disease, the first thing that comes to our mind is fungicide applications, right? So here I'm going to jump right in. I'm going to present the results of a uniform fungicide trial that we call UFT that was conducted here in the state of Oklahoma in 2023. So a uniform fungicide trial is a trial, is a protocol that state extensionists such as myself and others across the southern states and especially in the corn belts, we perform the same trial. So for this experiment, we have the same products with the same rate that was applied and also in this applying at the same time. 
And this is very good because it allows us to combine all this data set in the end of the season and compare our, all those results. So we are able to provide for the growers um, uh, tables and uh, information about the efficacy of those fungicides performed at different in, uh, environmental conditions across the United States. So for this experiment, we had 10, 10 treatments. We have the first one that's the untreated control where no fungicide was applied. And then we have other products that we apply, such as uh, Quadris, it's a common one, Triva Pro, Lucento, among others. So one, another goal that we have for this trial is not just to evaluate the efficacy of those fungicides, but also to see if the products that have uh, two or three modes of action in its composition, they perform better than the products that just have one uh, mode of action. So let's see the results for that trial, right? That was conducted here in Bixby, uh, in, uh, in Oklahoma, in Tulsa County. So we didn't observe any disease severity throughout the growing season because of the hot and dry conditions that we experienced. So I was not able to tabulate the data and compare the efficacy of the fungicides to manage and to decrease the severity of disease. However, the data that I'm going to present here is the impact of those fungicide applications in the yield of the, the soybean crop. So as you may see here, we have yield in the in bushes per acre in the y-axis, and we have the different treatments here in the x-axis. And the first one is the check, the control, where no fungicide was applied. So I'd like to highlight here that for 2023 growing season, we didn't see any difference among the treatments. In all the fungicide applications, they statistically did not differ from the untreated check. You can see that all of them receive the same letter. A means that all of them are considered statistically similar. So we didn't have any, uh, any influence of applying these fungicide applications to increase yield. However, when you look a little bit closer in, the, in this data, and we draw a, a line here in 50 bushels per acre, that is the average for the untreated check, we see that we do have some fungicide, uh, fungicide products that they increase yield when compared with the untreated check. And I'm highlighting here the, the average me for each one of those trials. And you can see that all of the trial, the, all of the forced applications, they increase yield when compared with the untreated check. They may not be, be statistically different, but they help to increase yield. And I highlight here in red all the best treatments that we had. Uh, one of those was Maravistop that provides 61.5 bushels per acre. We also have Topsin that was the provide uh, more yield in all the compared with all the other treatments, and also Trivapro. And another question that I mentioned is regarding the modes of action, right? If a product that has more modes of action in its composition is going to be better, perform better than ones with just one mode of action. And in this case, we are not seeing a, a clear picture about that because we have Topsin here that provided the highest yield that just have one mode of action. When compared with Trivapro, for example, that has three modes of action, but provide a little bit less yield than, uh, than Topsin. And we also have here Maravis Top that has three modes of action. So in this case, for this growing scissor, we are not able to separate these products very well regarding the efficacy and regarding this, um, what is the benefits of adding more modes of action in the fungicide applications. Another trial that we conducted here in Oklahoma, also in Bixby, in Tulsa County, is to test this new product that we have in the market that calls Zyway. So Zyway is um, a product that has just one uh, mode of action. It's a group three, so it's a flutriophal, sorry, that is a triazole fungicide. And the way that this product has been marketed, in, that has been sold and marketed, is that the growers can apply this fungicide at planting in the soil. So when I say at planting, is that this product should be uh, applied at planting um, two inches below the ground and two inches far from the seed. And in this case, um, they used, the people that are selling this product used to say that the, the roots, the plant is going to start to grow up, the root is going to absorb this product from the soil, and then the plant is going to be healthier for a longer period of time throughout the growing season. Since the beginning of the season, acting like similar as a seed treatment, but also to manage the foliar disease until at least the reproductive uh, stages. Uh, this product needs to be applied at what we call two by two at planting, two inches down, two inches far from the seed. If you apply this product at furrow, you're going to experience germination uh, problems and you're going to reduce the extent of the crop. 
So in the beginning, they are selling as an informed product, but it's not an informed product. You need to apply it a, far, a little bit far from the seed, but not so far. It needs to be close enough that the root system can absorb that product from the soil, and then the product is going to move systemically into the plant, uh, at least how it's being marketed, right? And then uh, the whole plant is going to have, uh, you'll be protected for a long time. So here I'd like to present some results that are from an experiment that was conducted from some colleagues at Michigan State University, where they apply Zywe in a cornfield, and then when the corn plants were at R3, they went to the field and they collect samples from all the leaves of the plant and also from the roots and the stalk. And the results are kind of surprising because they are able to trace this product in all of the, the components of the plant that they collect, the leaves, the stalk, and the roots. So the, the, the assumption that the product is moving systemically into the plant actually is the, is the right assumption. It is being translocated up into the plant. So here's the treatments that we applied uh, for the trial that we conducted in Oklahoma in 2023. We have five treatments. The first one is the untreated control, where no, no Zywe was applied, nothing was applied. And the second one, we have Zywe that was applied at a rate of 10.5, at 2 by 2. And we also apply Zywe in another treatment, but then we increase the rate. We apply that 15.2 uh, fluid ounces per acre, so a higher, a higher rate to see how, how will be the effect of these two rates. And we also apply these two rates, the 10.5 and the 15.2, but then we apply Zywe at two, uh, two by two at planting, followed by application of Lucento in R3 uh, to manage uh, foliar disease that was still present, possible present in the crop. So we have these five treatments here. And the results for this trial, as you may see here, in the same way we didn't observe any uh, severity of disease causing um, damage in the crop, so I don't have the efficacy of Zywe in decreasing the severity of disease or not. But then we see the yield of the crop in bushes per acre. Uh, we can see that statistically none of the treatments they differ from the untreated check. So statistically we didn't have any difference to apply neither Zywe in, by itself, neither Zywe followed by Lucento at R3. However, when you draw again this line F, the average for the untreated check, we can see that some treatments here, they provide more yield compared with the untreated check. However, are the two treatments where Zywe was applied followed by Lucento. So it's not very clear if Zywe is playing a role there to increase this yield, or if just one application of Lucento will be enough to already increase uh, a little bit these yields. And as you may see here, we have an average uh, these two forested applications followed by Lucento increase in at least five bushels per acre um, the yield in that, in that specific trial. Let's switch gears now and let's talk a little bit about fungicide resistance. Just as a reminder, reminder you guys already know about that, but we know that when we apply the same fungicides with the same modes of action, uh, repeatedly in the field, we're going to end up selecting individuals in the population that are resistant to those fungicides. So we know that in a population of the pathogen, we already have some individuals that are resistant to certain fungicides, naturally because of mutations. And then when you apply the fungicides over, over and over the same, we ended up selecting these organisms, they're going to multiply, and at some point they can take over the population. The resistant isolates, they can overcome uh, the susceptible isolates, and then is when you start to see the decrease in the efficacy of fungicides being applied in the field. I just would like to bring this reminder here that we just have actually for, for fungicides uh, right now that we actively use to manage disease in field crops, seven frag groups. And I'd like to ask you if you know if this number is a good number of frag groups that you have available to manage disease in crops. Or is a low number? Do you guys think that's a good number, a low number, a high number? We need more. We need more, right? Do you guys know how many herbicides we have, frag groups for herbicides we have available right now? Any guess? It's more or less? More, right? More. But you, you cannot answer because we're a specialist on that. But we have 17 frag groups that we can use for herbicides to manage weeds in the field. So if you guys think that it's difficult to manage weeds 
And uh, when you think about disease, actually we have much more options for weeds than we have for plant diseases. And this is a concern because over time we ended up losing some main groups of fungicides. And then uh, it would be difficult for us to have options to manage disease over time. So talk about the resistance of isolates. A uh, question that I have is, how about Oklahoma, right? How is the population of the pathogen look, looking like uh, in Oklahoma right now? And one of the diseases that I saw frequently in the field, especially in the end of the growing season, not causing damage in the yield, but because this year was so hot and dry, but it's still occurring with frequency in the fields, was Cercospora leaf blight. So Cercospora leaf blight is a disease that's caused by this pathogen, uh, actually caused for, for several species of Cercospora. So we already know it's already related by other, other colleagues that in the United States we have several species of Cercospora that cause uh, Cercospora leaf blight. And the symptoms that you see in the disease in the field, uh, when you go to the field we see this purplish color causing symptoms in the, in the leaf, and the, or this brown, bronze, or golden uh, color uh, in, in causing the symptoms. And you're always going to see this in the top of the canopy. So in, Cercospora is not a disease that you're going to look and scout in the lower canopy. You're always going to look in the top of the canopy. That's where the, the symptoms will be present. And Cercospora infects the leaves of soybean. But actually, the symptoms that you are seeing here, this purplish color and this brown, bronze or goldish color, is caused by a reflex of the toxin that's being produced by uh, this species of Cercospor. And of course, that if this disease in a high severity in the field, it may cause defoliation, uh, early defoliation in the crop, and then it's going to affect uh, the, the yields uh, in the end of the season. Uh, so looking at some uh, works that colleagues have been doing in other universities, I realized that actually this, the, the species of Cercospora that cause Cercospora leaf blight, they already have, they were identifying that they have QOI fungicide resistance. And the places that they found QOI fungicide resistance was Arkansas, Missouri, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, and Kentucky. And look at this map, I thought, how about Oklahoma, right? Because the pathogens, they move across the states. We know that. So they don't distinguish between, oh, here's the border with uh, Missouri and Oklahoma. Let's stop there, not cause disease, and the resistance isolates is not going to move. Not, that's not how it works, right? Because the pathogens are transported very easily by wind or by rain. So the first question for me was like, I need to take a look on that and see how is the population here in the state. And th that's what we did, actually. So to answer this question about the resistance of isolates of Cercospora causing Cercospora leaf blight here in Oklahoma, we collected samples in two, in two counties, uh, in Tulsa County and also in Pot uh, County. And I, I don't know how to say the complete name for this county here. And then we brought samples back to the lab and we isolated the pathogen that was caused that Cercospora symptoms. And with these isolates, we tried to answer two questions. What is the population that's causing Cercospora leaf blight? Do we have just one species or do we have more species involved? And the second question is, is, this, is, this, is the population resistant to QOI fungicides? And here we already have uh, the preliminary results for that work. This is still a work in progress. But we are able to isolate 44 isolates, the total from these two fields. And the first question that we'd like to answer regarding the, the population, right? Which species are causing Cercospora? And we identified that actually Cercospora flagellaris is the predominant species here with 93% that's causing disease here in Oklahoma. And we have other three isolates that represent 6% uh, of other species of Cercospora that are causing disease. So we have other species, but they're not in high in a high population, high concentration. And this actually match with the other results from, from other states uh, that they conducted in this study where Cercospora flagellaris was the main species associated with Cercospora leaf blight. And we kind of follow in the same results that they have. And regarding the resistance of those isolates for QOI fungicides, we found that only 6% of the isolates, they present QOI resistance. So in this case, uh, we have uh, exactly the same numbers for the, for the species. So we have 41 isolates that are still susceptible for QOI fungicides, and we have three isolates that are resistant to QOI fungicides. So this is actually very good news for us. This means that QOI fungicides is still a strategy that we can use in the state because the isolates, most of them, are still uh, susceptible. 
Of course, that we need to continue this work and explore all the regions in Oklahoma because I just collected from two fields, so it's very restric restricted uh, sample size. But if we expand the results, then we can have more, uh, a more clear idea about the resistance of the isolates. But so far, we can say that uh, QOI is still an available strategy that we have um, that can be efficacious to manage uh, uh, surcost relief blight here in the state. So the take home message for now for this talk is that the application of foliar fungicides are not needed in Oklahoma in years that we have the conditions as 2023, very hot, very dry, because we saw that they did not differ in relationship with the untreated check, the one that didn't receive any fungicide application. We have new products in the market, such as Iway, but we still need to test this product in more in different environments in Oklahoma. We know that we have a huge contrast between the east and the west part, and I just tested this in one field, so we need to expand this in other years and see how this new product is going to perform in this rough conditions that we experience here sometimes, right? We know that the pathogen populations are dynamic and they change over time. So it's not because now I collect samples and I find a population that is, pre, uh, we have one more species that's dominant, but this can change over time. Accordingly with the change in the cultural practice, the pressure that the fungicide is going to exert. So we need to continue to monitor these populations. And we also need to monitor for fungicide resistance because in the same way, populations of patterns are dynamic and we are going to start to put in the selection pressure by applying fungicides and we can end up selecting more a population that's more resistant to QOIs or other fungicides. And I think that we're thinking very, uh, very, in a very common way, Mary and me today, because we have similar slides. <laughs> and I'd like to bring here this very nice resource that we have to manage not just plant disease, but insects and weeds that call Crop Protection Network. So this is a website, um, and here it's saying in very small letters that this is a product of, of land-grant universities. And what this means, right? This means that the state, state extensionists, such as myself, Marion, extensionists from other states in the Corn Belt in the southern states, we get together regularly and we produce content regarding the most up-to-date information that we have to manage plant disease, insects, and weeds. And the crops that we focus in these websites, for now, we, we, we have plans to expand, but for now is wheat, soybean, corn, alfalfa, and cotton, so these five crops. And we have several resources here. We have, for example, podcasts, YouTube videos, how to scout fields, uh, weed loss calculator, if you have some information about the field that you'd like to calculate the yield loss. We have an image library in case you are seeing some, some symptoms in the field, you can take pictures and compare with the image library, try to provide a better uh, diagnose for that disease. And the most valuable resource that I think that we produce as a group, as a product of land-grant universities, are the fungicide efficacy tables. So Mary already presented the fungicide efficacy table for wheat, and we also have here for corn and soybean, that's two crops that I'm, I have been working with. And every, every year in a meeting that happens around February, March, all the extension stationists, states specialists, we get together and we update this table. So this table has the old products that we have been available in the market for a while, but we also have the new products, the ones that we are testing right now, and you're already uh, seeing the efficacy of those fungicides. And this is very good because uh, we can provide inputs and say, for example, okay, this, this product's not working very good for environmental conditions in Oklahoma. So we try to give a note here that is going to say, okay, it's not very good or excellent, it's just good, because we try to adapt this uh, and make a fair comparison of those fungicides across different environmental conditions. And here is the same uh, QR code if you'd like to scan and go to that website or save this for later. Uh, it's a very useful resource and then um, people that are more visual can read stuff, people that like to listen can listen podcasts, people that like to watch YouTube videos can also uh, go and search for it. Uh, and I would like to thank a lot of people involved in this work, but especially Oklahoma Soybean Board for the funding to, to conduct this work. Uh, Dr. Josh Lof, Lofton is his crew because he, he kind of planned and maintained all the plots for me throughout the grain season. And Brian now is his crew because sometimes he also harvests for me some plots. And especially thanks for my visiting scholar, Luana Miller, that's the one that conducts the foreside applications. 
And you guys are probably wondering what have I done, right? Because all the people did the work for me. <laughs> but I have a lot of good people to work here in Oklahoma. I'm very, uh, very, very happy for that. And thank you very much. I will answer any questions that you may have. Any questions for Maida? Okay, <laughs> to Josh. All right. That's great. Uh, oh. The cost for does it mostly come in on C or is it one more? And can you repeat the question? The question is if Cercospora survives on seed. So we have two diseases actually that are this, we consider them distinct disease. That is the purple uh, seed and Cercospora leaf blight. So purple seed is also Cercospora species that cause disease and they survive in the seed. And then it, it's very easy to see that because the symptoms are purple in the seeds. And, uh, but for Cercospora leaf blight, the patches survive in the crop residue from one going season to another. And Cercospora leaf blight is a disease that's difficult to manage because we don't have varieties that uh, are resistant for that disease. We know that some crop rotations cannot have a huge impact of this patch because can move, the spores can move from one field to another. And then for purple stain, we recommend if your seed is in the seed and you're planning to plant the seeds in the next year, you need to apply a seed treatment but uh, one for side application, even for managing purple seed, is, rec is recommended um, in, in, to try to decrease the severity of the disease and try to harvest the plots a little bit early, not let them expose in the field for a long period of time and for humidity, rain. But it's, it is a challenging disease to manage, for sure. Any other questions? All right, thank you, thank very, you very much. much. Thank you. All right, so so um, happy to uh, welcome to the stage our next two set. Uh, they have a presentation, but it's not uh, maybe a heavily scientific presentation. Uh, really excited to have uh, two new hires. They both came in before the semester, so they uh, uh, they've had one semester worth on the ground with us. But we have new two new weed scientists in our department, which was. Uh, uh, one, well, actually, it's two more than we had a couple months ago, but which is definitely uh, one more than we had about a year ago. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Swati Suresta and Dr. Liberty Gav Galvin, sorry. And uh, they're going to introduce themselves to the crowd. Come on up. I won't wait. Oh, okay. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Brian Arnold, for introducing us. And as he mentioned, I'm Swati Shrashta, and I am the new weed research scientist at the Oklahoma State University, and I have my colleague here. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. You got my name right. He was my teacher during undergrad, and he didn't get my name right until 10 years later. <laughs> uh, I'm Dr. Liberty Galvin. I'm the new um, extension weed scientist. My appointment is 85% extension, 15% research. So Dr. Shresta and I are a team. That's why we asked Dr. Arnall if we could come up here and introduce ourselves uh, together. Um, many of you, obviously you're here because you do a lot of field work. You may be seeing my face a lot in the field because of my appointment, but there is a very serious behind the scenes individual working diligently in the lab to answer some of your um, deeper questions that I can't answer with my tiny research appointment. Um, now we're going to talk just briefly about our background. We don't want to burden you too much, but something in her history may spark your interest. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, back to me again. So uh, I did my master's in weed science at Mississippi State University, where I was working with weedy rice. I have quite a bit of experience in screening for herbicide resistance, because I was doing that for weedy rice, which is one of the major rice in uh, major weed and rice fields uh, while I was doing my master's. And I also have experience of uh, understanding the genetics behind the herbicide resistance. That is the mutations that is causing herbicide resistance in weeds. So basically, I did that in my master's. After that, I moved to Texas A&M, where I did a little bit of research in sorghum. So I have experience of working with sorghum as well. 
And then I recently uh, finished my PhD from the University of Florida, and then I joined Oklahoma State University as uh, a weed research scientist from August. So here at Oklahoma State University, uh, both Dr. Galvin and I, we plan on doing uh, wide scale uh, survey, surveying for identifying the herbicide resistant weeds, mostly in wheat crop, because wheat, wheat is one of the major crops here, and Italian ryegrass, wild oats, also cheat grass. We have heard from a lot of growers that uh, there are some resistance issues or herbicides are not acting as effectively as they should in those grasses, but we don't have that firm record of whether it's because of resistance or because of application timing uh, issues. So we both plan on doing those kind of research. Um, I also plan on digging deeper into the genetics behind those herbicide resistance. So that's some of my plans that I have. And I'll hand over the mic to Dr. Galvin, who will talk about her stuff. <laughs> uh, so, OK, background, current, future. OK, so I grew up here in Oklahoma. I did my bachelor's degree here at Oklahoma State. Um, after that, I went to the University of California, Davis. I have a master's degree in international ag development. Um, I was a technical advisor for the USDA for a little bit, doing a foreign ag services project. It's about as far as my master's degree got me. And then it got me into the horticulture and agronomy PhD program at UC Davis. Um, funny enough, I also worked on weedy rice during my PhD. There's a lot of uh, previous rice folks who have now migrated to OSU. Just fun little fact. Uh, the majority of my research was applied but I'm really more of a biology and an, and an ecologist. So what are the environmental factors that are influencing weed growth and development? Um, can we use those factors to manipulate our field? Um, maybe we do want the weeds to grow so that we can hit them with a herbicide. Maybe we don't want them to grow. Um, I have a lot of experience with germination. Really excited to work with Dr. Shrestha on some of this resistance stuff. Um, a lot of things that I've heard from growers maybe it's resistance, maybe your weed is five feet tall and your herbicide isn't working, right? So I would really like to work on timing of application. Um, a lot of labels I've read has timing of application in terms of wheat growth, but not necessarily in terms of weed growth. And so that's some information I would like to put out. Also finding a lot of info from the late 90s and it's 2023. So I'm hoping in the next year, you are gonna see us more um, with resistance information. Um, I will be uh, hopefully partnering with um, Josh Bichong, ODAF, the pesticide safety folks to do a lot of continuing ed. I know there's a lot of need for that here in the state. Um, and working on that timing of application stuff with a longer goal of maybe creating an app with the Mesonet. Um, hey, hi Wes. Uh, so that is um, kind of what is on the frontier for the new weed science program at Oklahoma State. Uh, we wanted to, do you have anything else you wanna say? You good? Okay. Um, we wanted to give the crowd a brief moment. If you would like to influence weed science at Oklahoma State, now is your time to ask us a question or if you have a comment or if you're like, I have mayor's tail, what do I do about it? I will, I will make that note. Josh, <laughs> Josh. <laughs> I will give you a whole meeting, Josh, if you would like to. <laughs> for the resistant uh, weeds, oh, yeah. yeah, that's the plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, it does need to be updated. Yeah. So I'm actually in the process of looking at a USDA grant that I would love to talk to you about. Um, and it is explicitly for extension communication. So these continuing eds, um, fact sheet updating, uh, doing continuing ed in rural places that you typically don't see an in-person class occurring. Um, we also have some old stuff uh, like the herbicide screening that has Misha and Todd's name on it. Um, we would love to get the screening program back up, but it doesn't have any current weed scientist name on it. So that is in the works. Also, I found a bunch of uh, old packets 
And there's a lot of words like did not germinate, um, dif uh, unknown location. So I think there's also opportunities to hone that a little bit. And we definitely should talk more about that. Screening program is gonna get up and going. We will have funding for that. Resistance questions. Okay, I know it's the end of y'all's day. Really appreciate really appreciate y'all coming. Oh, where are you? <laughs> Who did? Okay. I'm, yes, we're doing it. It's going in the notes. Can you spell that for me? Yeah. Camelina. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, does it grow rapidly, produce a lot of seeds, have multiple reproductive methods, uh, aggressively overtake bare spaces? Yeah, it kind of sounds like trouble, but yes, I will talk with him more about that. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Well, appreciate everybody coming in. Uh, we'll get the QR codes up. The applicator license sign up is on the front table. QR codes on the front tables. Parking passes on the front tables. You are the few, you are the mighty that made it through the entire thing, and I greatly appreciate you. Uh, make sure you tell your friends that they're worthless and they should have stayed for the whole thing. Uh, we do want feedback as this time. So, market. Um, it's going to be December 17th and 18th, or 18th and 19th. It's that, that Tuesday and Wednesday in December. We will have it here. I'm not moving it. I had enough quick enough feedback. We'll be at the Student Union next year, the Tuesday and Wednesday. We will start, for those of you who showed up yesterday at 8 o'clock, we will start at 10, registration at 8. The goal is that you can have a single night and not a two-night hotel bill, so a single night. So registration at 8, uh, agenda starts and everything will start at 10 a.m. so we can have that travel in. Uh, we'll probably keep it as still a full, two full days. And my plan is, she wasn't here earlier, but Dr. Galvin, by, by the way, you also didn't get my name right, so it's okay. Or not all. Yep. Um, and so we're going to have a fuller IPM session next year. And we'll talk to the uh, ag retailers to make sure they honor that. But with that, everybody, thank you so much for coming to the Winter Crop School 23. These uh, videos will be downloaded and made available uh, to everybody out there. Vamanos. <laughs>